Good evening. My name is Scott Smith. We just finished a presentation by Jay Watts, but the audio from my introduction and the first 10 or 15 seconds of Jay's presentation were lost, so I'm recording again after the fact. I'm with the group TC Apologetics. TC stands for Traverse City. We're based in Traverse City, Michigan. Apologetics is a word, while not familiar to many, based on a Greek word that means to present a defense for, much in the way that you would make a case in court. Typically, we're concerned with making a case for theism, more specifically Christianity. Not all of the cases we present are exclusive to Christianity. There are other issues that are important to Christians that, while not exclusive, are core to the Christian message, such as tonight's topic, the sanctity of human life. To that end, we are proud to be able to bring to town a speaker named Jay Watts, who is affiliated with the Life Training Institute. Jay is the Vice President of Life Training Institute and an international speaker on the subject. While here in Traverse City, Jay has spoken to a number of groups in a variety of venues. He's been to churches, schools, and tonight you're about to watch his presentation given at Northwestern Michigan College's Scholars Hall. This presentation was intended to be directed at an academic audience and in this presentation, he will be making a positive case for life. Please join me in watching Jay Watts. There you, there you go. All right. <laughs> uh, to teach people how to talk about it, to think about the issue, and then other, oftentimes we engage either going onto college campuses to gauge the uh, issue more academically, or we actually engage the other side in debate. It's not always easy to get debates set up, but oftentimes the people on campus do a good job at finding someone on campus that wants to debate the issue in front of the student body, and generally when we do so, uh, we do it to model that we can have a productive conversation about this issue without it degenerating into something ugly. Uh, we, we do so so that people can see that we're capable of talking about the issues most important to us without hating the people that we're talking to or without having to cast the people that disagree with us in the most negative light possible. And so my understanding for my job tonight is that I'm going to give a positive case for life, that I am to explain what the pro-life position is. And to that end, I have some, a few limitations. Uh, number one, we have to recognize that uh, this m issue is not just immense as far as all of the different aspects of it that are cover, but the people that I will be representing tonight, the people who taught me how to discuss and argue this view and how to think this thing through. When you talk about people like Francis Beckwith at Baylor University or Patrick Lee or J.P. Moreland from Biola or uh, Christopher Kayser at Loyola or Maureen, Dr. Maureen Kondik or even my boss, Scott Klusendorf, we're talking about people that have written for years and years several volumes of books to address just the pro-life side. So giving you a pro-life position is going to be very limited. And in trying to do that, I want to address some of the better arguments or the things that I think are the better criticisms against the pro-life side from on the other side, and even on that side, you have people like Marianne Warren, you have people like uh, Marley McDonough, you've got uh, Jeff McMahon, and, and my favorite of the other side would be David Boonin, who have written volumes and volumes and volumes from their side. And so we're going to have a limited look. This will be an introduction to the topic tonight, and it'll be primarily an introduction to the viewpoint that I represent as I go out into the world to talk about the pro-life. My hope for tonight is that pro a positive position on the pro-life view so that people can understand what it is that we're saying when pro-lifers say that we think that the human life has value. They can understand the source of those types of arguments we're going to be making. And I hope to give an honest portrayal of the criticisms of it and then addressing some of those criticisms as we go. All of this is going to be fairly limited, but hopefully we're going to do it in a very positive way. Now, I am unabashedly Christian, but my arguments will not be that. So you may hear me talking tonight, and you may hear things that I say about praying or things, but they will not be in relation to the arguments. I am a Christian, and I am not going to pretend to be neutral on this issue. I'm a Christian that believes that the unborn are fully human in morally important ways, the same way that you and I are, and that because of that, there are certain rights that ought to be extended to them. So those two things I, accept, I, I make a claim right out from the outset, but I want to be clear as we move on that the reason I discuss this issue is because I once was a pro-choice atheist. The reason I'm so passionate about this, I was on the exact opposite side of this issue. And so I have over the years changed my mind about what I believe, not just about Christianity, but, but as in regards to abortion, one of the first things that I did pray as a Christian, for those of you who are not Christians, you know, I, I apologize for entering into this, but one of my first prayers as a Christian was, God, please let me go the rest of my life without ever having to talk about abortion. Because when I was a pro-choice guy, I saw the absolute worst of the fight from both sides. I remember friends of mine that I knew 
telling me experiences of going to abortion clinics and being screamed at and yelled at by people who profess to be God-fearing Christians who are calling them baby killers and murders. And these women at the worst moment of their life while they're doing and struggling with something terrible were being assaulted and attacked by the very people that who was a Christian I now recognize God called them to love. And so I saw the worst side of the pro-life side, even to the extent that it brings out the worst in us, hatred, violence, and ultimately murder. I've also seen the worst side of the pro-choice side. I've seen the people who are hateful and vile and ugly to the people who disagree with them, casting them in the worst light imaginable, saying that by virtue of believing that human beings are human from the, the moment they come into conception, that I must hate women and I'm seeking to oppress them in every form. All of those sides, I think the discourtesy, the disservice, and the anger, the violence that we've seen from both sides are something that I hate as a human being and as a Christian. And so one of the reasons that I feel passionately about what I get to do is that I recognize two things. Number one, this is an ugly issue that brings out the worst in everybody. And number two, it's an issue that must be talked about. It must be talked about because it is one of the greatest moral issues of our age, no matter which side you come down on the issue. We have invitations to over 22 countries of the world to come around and speak. It's not just an American issue, it's happening all over the world. People are trying to determine where they ought to stand and how they ought to fall in the laws that they're setting in their country rooted in this issue, based on the issue of abortion. And so when I go out and talk to people, I recognize that we're dealing with something that's difficult to talk about, but that must be talked about because it cannot be ignored as one of the great moral issues of our age. No matter which side, when you look at the numbers, if you believe that the unborn are fully human in the same way that you and I are, and we look at the some 50 to 55 million in the United States abortions since 1973 alone, and the numbers just came out of China where they released it, where we're talking about 336 million abortions in China since 1971 and the one child policy enacted in that country. You're talking about numbers that far eclipse wars that went before this. 336 million is greater than the population of the United States and Australia combined. If the unborn are human, you're talking about the loss of life on a massive scale, the likes of which this world has never seen. Not all in one time, not like this. But if they're not, if the unborn are not human, we live in a time when ideologically driven, morally driven, maybe religious people who have good intentions and are well intended in what they're doing are interfering in the free choices of women all over the world. They're interfering in presidential elections. They're interfering in legislative elections and Senate elections. They're interfering in the, the, the uh, appointment of Supreme Court justices. And they're doing all of this and as much as all the effort and spending millions of dollars on a misplaced belief that the unborn are valuable. In the actuality that this procedure is nothing different than a tooth extraction. Either way, it is a grave moral evil that we have to address. Something has gone wrong. And so the only way to get to it is to get to the heart of it. And we may wish it to go away. Actually, one of the things that was interesting was that after Barack Obama was reelected, there was a poll that came out. And in that poll, it said that over 55% of the people in the United States no longer believe that abortion is an issue that is that big a deal in the United States. It's funny that they said that right after this last election because this last election offered a great deal of evidence to the contrary of that belief. The fact of the matter was that they were uh, Barack Obama, that when the, uh, Tucker Carlson was on Fox News on the night of the election. He said, there's an interesting thing that's going on in this country. What most people don't know is how key abortion was to this election. And what he means by that is that most of the country is either red or blue by nature. And I live in Georgia. Georgia was a red state. Mitt Romney was going to win Georgia no matter what. There was nothing that Barack Obama could do to win Georgia. I was in, I've been in California twice in the last couple of weeks. California was a blue state. There was nothing that Mitt Romney could do to win. Barack Obama had California. He was going to win it. And so you had key states like Ohio and like Pennsylvania and like Florida, like Colorado, those places where it was not known what was going to happen until the very end. And especially in Ohio, the phone calls, the robo calls, the television commercials, the radio spots, they all focused on abortion. Cecile Richards, who is the president of Planned Parenthood, the largest abortion provider in the United States, was going door to door in Ohio telling people, the Democratic base, that if you don't get out and vote for President Obama, if you don't reelect him, we're going to lose the abortion issue for an entire generation. There were two can candidates for senator in the last election, two men who were Republicans who were leading their, in the polls in their races. Both of those men at different points were asked questions about rape and abortion. Both of those men answered that question poorly. Both of those men lost their elections after that moment. Millions of dollars that they spent all of the political capital that was expended for them, all the commercials, all the radio. One question about abortion completely destroyed their election. There was nothing that they could do to recover because they answered that question badly. And there is a startling 
example of how important abortion is to us and how key it is to what goes on in our culture going on right now. Two years ago, there was a man by the name of Kermit Gosnell, an abortion provider out of Philadelphia. He was arrested. The grand jury report that was printed up two years ago came out, and it was the most grisly, horrifying things that were going on in that clinic that you could possibly imagine. Not just the practice of abortion, but the mistreatment of women and the idea that there were cats running around in this facility, uh, uh, going to the bathroom everywhere. There was blood. They were, they were reusing uh, a different, uh, different instruments over and over again on different women. If you went to the recovery room, they said it was lazy boys covered in blood and tissue from where they were just sticking those women in there. The only reason that this got stopped, and it's far worse, and I'm not going to share with you because it would be an offense on your senses, and you can go find out for yourself. The only reason it got stopped was because he was also dealing drugs illegally. And when they were raided for the illegal drugs, all of the things that were seen, including where he was keeping the body parts of the babies that he had aborted in jars for some reason all around the facility and then loaded up a freezer with those body parts, all of these things that they saw at that point had already been seen by other people and it had all been covered up. And for two years, the media didn't talk about it at all. Five weeks into his trial, where all of this stuff is going on to per public record and the evidence be keeps getting, getting introduced, we're talking about a culture that is obsessed with trials. We obsess over trials all the time. We love the criminal justice system. Half of our shows are about trials. Even our fiction is all about trials. And one of the worst, most astonishing cases in history is going on right now, and it was a complete media blackout. Finally, after there was a huge uproar through the Twitter and Facebook verse, universe, Kristen Powers, who considers herself a liberal woman and a pro-choice woman, wrote an article that said, this ought to be front page news all over the United States. This ought to be looked at by everybody, and the reason that it's not being looked at is because it's about abortion. Megan McArdle, a pro-choice feminist, stepped out and said immediately thereafter, wrote an article, and to her credit, the next day, she said, I don't know what's going on, I've known what's going on, it makes me sick, and I haven't been talking about it, and the truth is that I will not talk about it because it's about abortion. And she showed a picture of the trial, of the, of the room, of the courtroom, and there were seats that were set aside for the press to come in and to watch and to keep track of the trial. Empty. All of them completely empty. They're not even there watching it. And, and since Megan McArdle and Kristen Powers came out, others have come out and said the same thing, all from the other side. It is obvious that this ought to be front page news. It is obvious that this has every element of the sensational courtroom drama that we usually obsess over in this country, and that the reason that we're not looking at it is because of abortion. And go back and read the grand jury report. The grand jury report will tell you that they knew about it at the Pennsylvania State Department. They knew about it at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. The local university hospitals in the area knew about what was going on in Gosling's uh, clinic. The National Abortion Federation actually sent somebody in to tour the facility and they saw every bit of it. And though they wouldn't give him any recommendations, they would not report what they saw or try to close him down. And even Governor Tom Ridge, a pro-choice Republican governor, said that we will no longer go in and inspect abortion facilities. The grand jury report that was done by people who had no political axe to grind at all said the only reason that this happened for as long as it happened was because it centered on the issue of abortion. The idea that this is not important to us any longer, that it is an issue that has gone away, is contrary to all the evidence that we see. So we're going to have to learn to talk about it. We can't be afraid to discuss it because it's there and it's happening all the time. And so how do we get our hands around How do we start to, to process this issue? Well, as I present the position that I represent tonight, uh, as I start to make the case, I'll tell you how we go about it. First of all, we contend that if abortion may be a, a culturally complex issue, it may be a financially complex issue, it is most certainly a psychologically and emotionally complex issue. It is not a morally complex issue. For the sake of this discussion tonight, we're gonna to focus on the morality of abortion, and I'm not gonna enter into the legality of abortion. That would be something that would consume too much of the time that we're already to have too little of to discuss this. So we're gonna focus on the morality of the issue. It is psychologically complex, emotionally complex, culturally complex, and even financially complex. It is not morally complex. Whether or not abortion is morally permissible or not is going to come down to one thing. I was invited to participate in this lecture series 
And there was a woman, who she was a lawyer, she's a brilliant woman who I love dearly, and she was invited to give a 30-minute lecture, and she got up and she spoke, and they said, we're going, after she gets done, you're going to give a five-minute response to what she said so that we can get a sense, and there was a whole row of panelists. So the woman gets up, and she speaks for 45 minutes, and man, for that 45 minutes, she brought up everything wrong that she could think of about abortion. She went off on abortion breast cancer links. She talked about abortion increasing uh, the instances of child abuse in the United States. She talked about the fact that uh, women who, sh- who have abortions sometimes struggle from post-traumatic stress system. She went through all of this and listed it all. And for that audience, she went on instead of 30 minutes to 45, and they were completely overwhelmed by everything they said. And so when she got done, they looked at me and they said, man, she ran over. You got a minute. Is that enough time for you to respond? I said, yeah, I'm fine. And I got up and I said, uh, my colleague, whom I de- deeply respect tonight, has done a great job at illustrating for all of you over 45 minutes of all the things that are wrong with abortion. She has yet to clarify why abortion is wrong. Because If the unborn are fully human, then abortion is the unjustified taking of innocent human life. If they are not, all of those other things that she talked about, although they may be problems that need to be addressed, are nothing but the extra psychological and cultural byproducts of an elective surgery that does nothing wrong. If the unborn are fully human, though, even if every woman who ever had an abortion was happy, Even if every person who ever had an abortion never regretted it for a moment of life, even if it was a great good to society, even if it did innumerable good things and there was no negative impact for it whatsoever, it would still be a grave moral injustice. The question is, what are the unborn? That's what we have to focus on if we're going to determine the moral permissibility of abortion or not. What is the identity of the unborn? What are we doing to them? And do we have justification for that action? So we simplify the issue for focusing in on that. There is a guy, a philosopher by the name of Christopher Kayser. And Christopher Kayser gives a great demonstration. And I use an actual event that happened in my life to sort of help understand as we start to focus in on simplifying the issue. On December 25th, 1992, I was traveling from my mother's house to my grandmother's house, my father's mother's house. Now, That's Christmas, if you heard me say on December 25th. I'm a child of divorce, and so I would have Christmas morning with my mother's family. I would have Christmas afternoon with my father's family. And so I'd eat with her in the morning and open up all my presents there. And that's where Santa Claus would come, was over to my mom's. And then I would go to my dad's. Even in high school and college, by the way, Santa Claus continued to come to my house. I would travel over to my father's house and his family, and then we would open up just the ridiculous amount of presents that they poured on us over there. And so being a child of divorce, this transition was something I did every year. But on this particular day in 1992, as I traveled travel through Buckhead, there was an accident, an unavoidable accident. There was nothing that I could do to stop it, but an innocent life was lost. And it, this absolutely destroyed me. Emotionally devastated me on Christmas Day. And I could not get over it for about two or three hours. And then I started opening presents, and I started eating and enjoying some ice cold Cokes, and man, I was fine. And I never thought about it again for the rest of the day. Now, there's an important piece of information missing from that story, isn't there? What was the nature of the life that was lost? Now, I don't know what you have in Michigan, but in Georgia, we have these suicidal squirrels. And man, I'll be driving down the road, and those things ran out in front of me, and I tried to avoid that squirrel on that Christmas morning, but it was destined to die, and it threw itself under my tires no matter what I did. And when I looked in the rearview mirror, and I see his little body spinning in the road, of course, I feel horrible. I don't want to kill anything on Christmas Day. It was awful. But you understand then why when I got in, and I started to spend time with my family and all the rest of us, the squirrel just sort of left my mind. It really wasn't that big a deal. I can honestly tell you to this day, I don't have the slightest idea how many insects I killed on the way over to my grandmother's house. It may have been a a devastating devastating loss of life on the ants that I've never even thought of. Uh, I go from Atlanta down to Disney World with my family, and when you're driving through Florida, these prehistoric-sized bugs hit your windshield and just blow up. And I never once, when that happened, thought, oh my gosh, that poor bug. You know, what a terrible thing to happen there. Usually I just flood the windshield with that blue liquid and try to get it off so I can see the road and get on down. But what if it had been a child that died that day? A human child, a human toddler. What if it had run out in the road and I hit it? And then I told you, well, I got over this almost immediately. You would rightly judge that there's something wrong with me. How could you hit a child and get over it? You would understand that there's something different in the nature of a squirrel and insects and a child. And if I said I immediately got over it and was drinking Coke, you would say, that is just wrong. That ought to have been the kind of thing that bothered you forever. The the loss of a human life like that ought to have plagued you, bothered you. You ought to have never let it go. There's a difference depending on what the nature of the life is that we're talking about, that we intuitionally know. 
Now, I want to be clear before I move on, it was a squirrel. Uh, I only say that in every I, presentation I give because I gave one presentation, I didn't clarify it, and a man came up to me almost in tears afterwards, and he's like, how have you gotten through this? And I was like, gotten through what? And he's like, taking that life. It's like, you talking about the squirrel? It's like, no, no, that was a squirrel. It was not a human being. So it was, it was a squirrel that was lost that day. Greg Kokel of Standard Reason does another way of trying to show how we simplify the debate. He says, imagine you're in the sink washing your dishes and a child walks in behind you. For the purpose of this, it'll be my eight-year-old daughter, Mary Jackson. I talk about my kids a lot in my presentation, so get ready. So Mary Jackson walks in behind me and I'm washing my hands and Mary Jackson asks me this question. Daddy, can I kill this? Can I kill this? Well, what do I have to find out before I answer her? What is it? If it's an insect, yes, absolutely. I'm so thankful that somebody else in the house is going to finally join the ranks of the insect killers. Uh, if it's her little sister, let her go, an absolute no. So the nature of the life is important when we're trying to determine what it is we're allowed to do. And we go and have debates, and, the, and we have college professors representing the pro-choice position, and they stand up, and when they frame their debate, they talk about the liberation of women, and they talk about the idea of women not be slaves to the reproductive system in a way that's incompatible with men, that men are free in the marketplace in a way that women or not, and that they need abortion to be equal, and they ought not to be slaves, to the and by have the right, the privacy, and the privilege of being able to make medical decisions without the interference of anybody else. And they frame the entire issue on the women's rights, and, and they get to me, or they get to anybody representing our ministry, and we respond by saying, I agree with everything they just said. I don't hate women. I love women. I got two daughters. I got a wife. I got, I got a mother. I got three sisters. My life is filled with women that I love and adore and that I respect. And I'm radically pro-choice. I think that they ought to be able to choose any and all the things. They ought to be able to choose where they go to college, the man that they marry, where that they live, how they're employed. All of these things ought to be up to them. As a matter of fact, I agree with everything they said about abortion. I think that they're absolutely right that it ought to be the free choice of women. And if the government is going to pay for anything, it ought to also pay for that medical procedure. If we're in the business of paying for the medical procedures of people, why not that one? And I'm willing to step down from my position today as a pro-life advocate if, and it's an important if, if they can demonstrate through argument that the unborn are not the same as you and I. I'm going to make a positive case that the unborn are human in the same way that you and I are. And I look for my colleague over here to provide evidence that they are not. To answer the question, what are the unborn? And why are they something that we're justified in doing what we are doing to them? Because what we are doing is undeniable and incontrovertible fact. Why we're allowed to do it is the issue at hand. And we can't answer it until they identify to whom it is that we are doing this. We frame the issue on that because it clarifies it for the audience because we have to determine that there are limitations to other things that we do. Now, before we go on, there are two or three things or two things that we have to look out for, for all of us, if we're going to think clearly about an issue like this. And one of them is, uh, let me get some white chalk here. I love chalkboards. Uh, one of them is the ability for us to d discern the difference between subjective and objective moral claims. We live in a country and in a culture that has a terrible time with dealing with this. Subjective versus objective moral claims. Let me tell you, or just subjective and objective claims, I'll give you an example of subjective claims. Uh, I love bacon. Uh, I love bacon. Uh, so I make bacon, as, everything is better with bacon, man. Every meal gets immediately improved. Uh, Aubrey fixed a meal for us yesterday, and, and when I saw what she was fixing, she said it was uh, sweet potatoes wrapped in bacon. Oh my gosh, it was wonderful. Uh, I, I, I talk about bacon a lot because it's so important to me, and I go to places, and people give me bacon presents, uh, which have gone like someone's a bacon wallet. Somebody gave me bacon uh, bandages, uh, like band-aids that my kids love because they put it on their arms. Like, look at a strip of bacon, Dad. And, uh, and, and, and I was at one place where this girl stood up in the back after I got done at a college, and she said, I've got chocolate-covered bacon. Would you like some? And I was like, oh my gosh, yes. And she brought it forth, and I ate it, and it was like a, a Nestle's Crunch Bar made in heaven. It was divine. Uh, it was wonderful. My eight-year-old daughter, who I mentioned a moment ago, hates bacon. Hates it. And I look at her, I'm like, what is wrong with you? I mean, and all you look like a normal human being. I raised you better than this. How could you hate bacon? And her response to me is, Daddy, I put bacon in my mouth and I like it. You put bacon in your mouth and you don't like it. What she's giving us is an example of subjective truth claims. It's true that I love bacon, just like it's true that I love ice cream and Reese's peanut butter cups. 
Those are things that I love. And when I tell you those things, it's true. But that truth in no way obligates or requires anybody else to recognize it or change their behavior because I'm telling you something about the subject, me. It's autobiographical information. I love bacon. When my daughter says, I hate bacon, what she's telling you is true. It's true about the subject. She hates bacon. She doesn't like it. Too often when we start to talk about moral issues, especially abortion, people mistake the objective claim that we're making that abortion is wrong because it unjustly takes the life of an innocent human being with a subjective statement. And they'll say things in response to it, well, if you don't like abortion, then don't have one. Well, that's a mistake in reasoning because I'm not saying I don't like abortion. Well, as a matter of fact, my opinion on abortion is totally irrelevant to it. What I'm saying is that it is objectively wrong. And I point this out oftentimes when we're talking. I said, okay, what if I said to you that torturing toddlers for fun is wrong? It is wrong to torture toddlers for fun. And you responded to me, hey, you may not like torturing toddlers, but I enjoy it. And it's a family tradition in our house, and we do it every Friday night. And you keep your laws out of our house. Don't tell me what you like when we like to torture toddlers. Well, they would immediately understand that they are misunderstanding the nature of the claim that I'm making. They would see that when I said it's wrong, abortion is wrong, I meant the same way it's wrong to torture toddlers. We're talking about an object, something external to us. And in this case, the object is the action against a particular life, a life that is ending. I'm saying that the action in itself, itself is morally wrong and objectively so, and wrong for all people at all times. Whether I like torturing toddlers or whether I like abortion is irrelevant. It's whether or not it's morally permissible. That's the issue that we're going to have to get around. And so when I, I've had this conversation. Everybody in my ministry has had the following conversation with somebody. Uh, I was walking onto a church campus, and I met this gentleman, and I said, I'm looking for your pastor. And he said, okay, uh, why? What are you here for? Because if you go, if you're in ministry, you know you're, the people who work on your campus do a good job at trying to protect pastors. Uh, it's a good thing that they do because everybody wants to talk to the pastor, usually because they want to get money somehow from the pastor. Uh, and so he was trying to protect him, and he stopped me at the door. He says, why? What do you want to talk to him? I said, sir, I have an appointment. And he said, well, who are you? What? I said, well, I represent a ministry called Life Training Institute. And he said, well, what do you guys do? And I didn't really want to talk to the guy that much at that point, so I said, we talk about bioethics because I was trying to put him off the scent a little bit. And he said, oh, so you talk about things like abortion. I was like, yes. And he said, do you want to know what I think? I said, sure. Uh, he said, I think that abortion is wrong. Personally, I think it's wrong. But I think that it ought to be legal. Now, here is a first step in having a productive conversation. When somebody says something that we disagree with, the best thing to do is to ask a question in response and to not immediately start yelling at them and tell them how stupid I think they are. And so he says to me that he thinks abortion is wrong, personally, but he thinks it ought to be legal. So I said, sir, can I ask you a question? I said, sure, go ahead. I said, why do you personally think abortion is wrong? And he said, I think abortion is wrong because I, I think it's murder. I think it kills babies. I said, okay, do you mind if I repeat back to what you just said to me? And he said, sure, go ahead. I said, do you think that abortion is wrong because it kills babies, but you think it ought to be legal to kill babies? And he kind of thought about it for a second. He said, that doesn't sound right, does it? It's like, no, I don't think so. Uh, but we're talking about what you believe here and trying to understand where you're coming from on your views. You see, by asking him the question, he was able to see that he had made a mistake between subjective and objective. Now, there's another mistake that we make oftentimes when we're talking about abortion, and we make this mistake all the time. Uh, everybody makes this mistake at some point or another, but it does pollute the thinking. It's called presupposing or begging the question. When we presuppose or beg the question, what we do, begging the question, by the way, does not mean raising the question. That's just a little pet peeve of mine when people say that begs the question and then they raise the question. No, begging the question is an argumental fallacy. Raising the question is what they mean. When you beg the question or presuppose, you assume what it is your responsibility to prove by argument before you make your argument. Now let me give you an example of this because almost everybody that we talk to about abortion makes this mistake. Almost everybody on college campuses when I'm having conversations with students or even faculty about abortion will make this mistake. They will say things to me like, abortion must be, let's go, no, let's just stay off the students. I'll talk about a pastor that I was talking to one time. This pastor looked at me and said, abortion has to be legal because if it's not legal, Jay, what are we going to do with all these poor babies? And so I thought, okay, what he's saying to me is that abortion is a, is a solution for poverty. Now here's the problem. He has presupposed that the unborn are not human 
as he's thinking this thing through and he's made his argument. And I asked him, I set up what we call a trot out the toddler. I set up my hand on my hip and I say, well, pastor, I've got a two-year-old child standing next to me. This two-year-old child is the fourth of four children. Uh, there is no doubt that when this two-year-old child was born, she added to the financial burdens of this family. The mother has had to go back to work. The resources have been stretched to such an extent that it is now almost painfully impossible for this family to get by. And the three older children are now lacking the resources that could have been provided to them had this child not been here. Would it be okay in your mind for us to kill this child to relieve the financial burdens on this family? And the pastor looked at me shocked and he said, no, of course not. I said, well, why not? He said, well, because it's a human being. I said, okay then. Now, if the unborn are human in the same way this child is, we're not going to kill them for reasons of financial distress as well. So the question is not financial distress. The question is poverty. I mean, the question is not financial distress. The question is what are the unborn? We see this again. A, a guy stood up in a university and he said that women have to have a right to, to privacy. It's, Roe v. Wade has established a right to privacy for women on the issue of abortion. So women have a right to privacy, and that right to privacy uh, overcomes any rights that the unborn child have. I said, okay, I have a two-year-old child standing next to me, sir, and he is my, she is my next-door neighbor. And her father, every day in the privacy of her own home, is viciously abusing her viciously abusing. Her life is one humiliation and torment after another while she's in the privacy of her home. The only time she has any relent at all is when she steps out of her house. Would it be okay in your mind for us to violate the privacy of that family to go inside and to take that child out? He said, of course. Why? It's their life. It's their private life. It's their private matter. So we can't allow that child to be abused. Why? He said, because the child is a human being. Okay, then, if the unborn are human in the same way this child is, then privacy is not justification for abuse against them as well. Now, I'm not making my case. This doesn't demonstrate that I'm right. It doesn't make a case at all for the pro-life position. All it has done is demonstrate that they've made a mistake in their thinking, that they haven't thought about this at all. And all the justifications that they're offering, they would never offer if it were in the case of a toddler and taking the life of a toddler. And so we da we, uh, I'm acknowledging right at this moment the mistake that we make is that we presuppose. So before we move on, we have to be aware that those two mistakes that people make. So, so now let's get on to proving my case, or not proving my case, but offering my case, offering a positive case for the pro-life position. We start by simplifying the issue, focusing it on the question, what is the unborn? But how do we determine what is the unborn? Well, we're going to use science and philosophy to argue the identity of the unborn. Science to argue what they are, because that's what science gives us. And I can tell you without fear of correction, that the overwhelming majority of people, even in embryology textbooks and the field of science, and even the people on the pro-choice side or the abortion rights advocate side, the people who disagree with me about a lot of important things, almost all of them are going to concede these facts. From the moment that they come into existence, they're whole, distinct, and living humans whole, distinct, and living from the moment that they come into existence, from the completion of the fertilization process, the moment of conception, they are whole, distinct, and living. I have up here uh, pages upon pages here of different people from the other side, or from embryology textbooks, or from science programs, and all of these people are confirming the same thing over and over again. Here it is from Keith L. Moore in his book, The Developing Human Clinically Oriented Embryology, the seventh edition from 2003. Human development begins at fertilization, the process during which a male gamete or sperm unites with a fem female gamete or oocyte to form a single cell called a zygote. This highly specialized totipotent cell marked the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. A zygote is the beginning of a new human being. T.W. Sadler in Langman's Medical Embryology, the development begins with fertilization, the process by which the male gamete, the sperm, and the female gamete, the oocyte, unite to give rise to a zygote. Over and over again, the other side will concede. Pro-choice philosophers on these pages, and if you want to see them, you're welcome to them. That the other side concedes this point. For the most part, they, they, they will concede that we're talking about whole, distinct, and living. Whole is that they're not a part of anything else. They're not an organ of the mother. They're a whole, self-integrated, self-oriented, developing life in and of themselves. They are distinct. They are unlike any cell in the body of their mother or their father. And their distinctiveness is going to develop out of them because they're not constructed things. They are developing things. So even though at the time they come into existence, they're only about the size or a little bit smaller than a period on this page right here in front of you, they are still whole and distinct and they are alive. They are 
metabolizing. They are growing. And they will very shortly, very early in this life process, be able to respond to stimuli at a very basic level. That is all the criteria necessary, and that is more than is necessary to categorize them as living. And it's important what I said a second ago that we recognize that they're developing things. Now, there are some people who will offer up objections to that. Very few. The only reason I bring it up at all is because one of them is a man by the name of Dean Stretton, and he is a pro-choice philosopher, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for Dean Stretton, and so I don't want to go out and say nobody anywhere denies the humanity of the unborn from the moment of conception. Now, Dean Stretton has offered several criticisms to that point to where he's trying to demonstrate that they're not. And so we'll cover just a couple of them. One of them at the beginning is that he says that since more than half of fertilized eggs, which they like to call them, or zygotes, do not implant in the woman's uterus. We cannot call them living until they implant. Because more than half. Now here's the problem. Determining the number of spontaneous miscarriages in that manner on healthy women as opposed to where we get the information, which is from in vitro fertilization processes or places where we know there's already something going on and that they're being unnaturally putting in pregnancy, is terribly difficult. The number of about 50% of them is a difficult number to nail down because some people say, and some, and, uh, some articles, medical articles have been written that say that in a woman's natural healthy pregnancy that isn't uh, put in together by a uh, fertilization process, it's somewhere about 15% will spontaneously miscarry. But here's the thing, as determining whether or not they're whole, distinct, and living, that is not a criticism against that. That is just says that we have a problem that very early in their life we may be losing a great many of them that is unnecessarily lost. So Andrew Sullivan responds to this by saying that just because natural disasters happen doesn't mean that mass murder is morally permissible. Just because people will naturally die at some point, it doesn't mean that they are not human. It just means that there's something going on that we need to address with the ability of these women to implant the embryos inside of them. And as I said, it's impossible for us to know what the actual numbers are. But even going beyond that, in some places in the world, the infant mortality rate is exceptionally high. And over 50% of these children will die in the first year of their life. The same numbers that we're saying because of this spontaneous miscarriage or this failure to implant makes them inhuman can be argued then that those people who fail to get past their first year when over 50% of them can't live because of the problems in their society, that they're not human. Because it's the same level of massive death that we see here that we're talking about there. And so the question then becomes, does the fact that we die make us not human? Does the fact that we may die early on in our development make us not human? Now here's the thing though. This particular argument has nothing to do with abortion for the most part. It's mostly to do with embryonic stem cell research because nobody gets an abortion before implantation unless you're talking about certain contraceptions that can act as an abortifacient. When we're talking about medical and surgical abortions, they happen usually about six to eight weeks. More, the majority of them, almost 90% of them, prior to 12 weeks. They have to be done later when you're doing a surgical abortion because it's necessary for them to be developed enough so that we can put them together after they've been suctioned out of the woman so that we can make sure that we got every part of them so that the woman doesn't get sick of having left that tissue inside of them. So early on, most, most philosophers say that that criticism that just because they die early on means that they're not human doesn't hold because we're talking about their identity, not what happens to them. Now, there is another thing that they will say, that they'll say early on in the development of the life, we have a potentiality of twinning. And because it can break off and become two different lives, it becomes impossible to say that it was a single organism that existed prior to that. They said, well, there's no way to say that there was a single organism because it was two. And since there's no way for us to know, then prior to twinning, we can't say that there's a single organism, a whole distinct and living human being there because there might be more than that. And also they recombine. And because of this practice, if they recombine back into one, two became one. So they said there's too much doubt. There's too much inability for us to know. Again, all of this happens, by the way, in about the first 10 days of life. So we're still not talking about abortion. But even this doesn't hold because as Patrick Lee, the philosopher, said, what happens when you cut a flatworm in half? Does anybody know? You get two flatworms. All right, he so said you lay a flatworm on the table, you cut it in half, you will have two flatworms. It would not make sense from that point to extrapolate that you had no flatworms prior to that. Something must have divided. There had to be an organism there to divide up to become twins, and there must be organisms there 
to recombine to become one. Now, what it does mean is that it may not make sense if you're an identical twin for me to say that every person in this room's life began at conception because it's possible that your life began about seven or eight to ten days after conception. But it doesn't mean that there wasn't a whole distinct living human being from the moment of conception. It just means that it's quite possible that you're a twin. You weren't one of them. You weren't that one. And we don't actually understand fully what goes on with twinning. Here's another thing that we're starting to discover. Twinning has a biological component, a genetic component. We seem to notice that twinning runs in families, which means that the potential to twin may be a part of their distinctiveness from the moment they come into existence. And so it can't be used as something to say that they're not whole, distinct, and living, since it is their personal nature to twin. So both of those address that particular issue. And there, outside of that, there's, a, there's not very much problem with this. Almost everybody accepts this as a scientific criteria. I'll give you a quick story just to tell you uh, how easy that this is to understand for most people. Uh, my son, t 10 years old, my daughter 8, my other daughter's 4 years old, and my wife, we're all sitting around the dinner table one night several months ago now, uh, and my son, out of nowhere, with actually no provocation whatsoever and no warning it was about to happen, says, Mom, are you aware that there is a cell inside of a woman's body called an egg? And if this cell meets a cell from the man's body called a sperm, then a new life is made. Uh, and my wife shoots me this look like this is somehow my fault. And I'm like, oh, honey, I have the slightest idea why he's talking about this right now. You know, we have no conversation. And so she looks at Peyton and she says, Peyton, how did you know that? I know that, but how did you? And Peyton said, well, I was in daddy's study area and he had an anatomy book on the shelf. And so I pulled it out and started flipping through and he said, I read that. And man, I found that just fascinating. Uh, and then he said, but guys, it only happens like once a month. So I don't want you guys to worry that's going to happen all the time or anything. We're like, I appreciate you putting us at ease there, Peyton. So my 10-year-old son can pick up an anatomy book, not a religious anatomy book, not a pro-life anatomy book, just an anatomy book, and read this and walk away with a basic understanding Hold distinct and living life begins at that moment. Now, the dis distinction I mentioned earlier that we are developing things, we're not built things, we're not constructed things. The nature of some of the things that we see in ourselves was there from the moment that we came into existence. They weren't added to us. Unlike a car or that computer that is going to go on an assembly line, there's a point at which you say it makes sense to now say it's a computer, but prior to that it didn't make sense to call that a computer because it's constructed and it's built. And as a car goes, my boss loves Mustangs almost as much as I love bacon. He talks about them all the time. And he says as they're going down the construction line, there's a point at that where you're going to have to add something onto it and ultimately that piece is added and it makes sense to say that we now have a Mustang, but that prior to that addition of that part, we don't know what we had, just a car being built. Human life's not that way. It develops. My daughter, uh, the one that I mentioned earlier, uh, a couple months ago, she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. The moment that we got to the emergency room, when the endocrinologist walked in, he walked in and he said, I want you guys to know something. I want this, it's very important for you to know. There's nothing that you did that caused this. This is the way that she was from the moment that she came into existence. Now that's an important understanding about what I mean by developing things. What that doctor told me is that type 1 diabetes was a part of the distinct nature of her makeup from the moment that she came into existence. I just didn't know about it until she was 8 years old. It was always going to happen. I have had, from the moment that she came into existence, a diabetic daughter. I just didn't know it until a couple of months ago. The same way it was always going to happen that in my mid-30s, as my testosterone level rose, my hair was going to fall out and my hairline was going to start receding. And the glorious head of hair that I had in my 20s was always destined to go away. I just didn't know about it until that tragic day in my mid-30s when I realized that the battle for the hairline had begun and was already lost. That was a part of me from the moment that I came into existence. And it's a part of the distinct makeup that I have. And it only developed out of me and we found that out later. So, whole distinct and living from the moment they come into existence. So, what is the point of contention? If, as, as I told you, almost every one of the major pro choice philosophers out there, other than Dean Stretton, don't even argue that it's not whole distinct living from the whole. And, and I don't mean to diminish Dean Stretton, he's a, he's a colossal intellect. But when I'm talking about everybody else and all the embryology textbooks, everybody agrees that it's a whole distinct and living human life. So, what is it they're going to argue? Well, we've got to go to philosophy for that. Because they're not arguing that it's not human. They're arguing that it doesn't matter, that their humanity is not the issue. Uh, to give you a demonstration, let's, talk, let's go back to my son for a second. I, um, 
Obviously, I've been pro-life for several years, uh, but my kids did not know what I did for a living. There are some pro-life people that really like to indoctrinate their kids early. They show them graphic images. They take them to marches. I mean, being pro-life is just an intense part of their life. I don't want to do that to my kids. I want them to be able to be kids and kind of destroy, discover that the, the, the world was an ugly place or that there were things going on that weren't great later. And so I protected my kids from that. Now, as a result, my kids were always kind of confused about what my, their dad did for a living. Uh, we were going, uh, I worked at a crisis pregnancy center, and they have this little basket at these crisis pregnancy centers. They keep these little rubber 12-week fetus models so that we'd hand out to people so they could see what the development stage of the unborn were at 12 weeks. And my son would come in, and he would see those sitting there, and he'd pick them up, and he'd start flying around with them, and he'd be like, hey, daddy, it's Super Superman, look at it, Daddy. And I was like, man, that's weird. You're playing with a fetus. Put it down. Uh, and I remember him coming home one day, and he said to me, you know, Daddy, somebody asked me what you do for a living. He said, I don't really know. I think he sells babies. I was like, please, <laughs> please don't tell people that your dad sells babies. Uh, so he comes in one day, and he sees me reading a book by Robert George and Christopher Tolson called Embryo. And he says, hey, Daddy, what are you reading? And I don't want to tell him everything that I'm reading at that point. So I, I try to figure out a way that I can demonstrate to him what it is his dad does for a living without having to get all graphic and nasty, right? And so I look at him and I say, I got dry erase markers around my house, by the way, all over the place, because sometimes when I'm thinking things through, I write on mirrors and windows to help me get it through it. And so they're right there for me to grab. I grab it and I start to write on a mirror and I draw that line right there. And I say, Okay, Peyton, let's say that this line segment that I've written up here represents, he was six years old at the time, so let's say this represents your life. And this is the moment of your birth. Now let's say this is you at six. This is you at 10. Let's put the one there. This is you at 30. And this is you at 60. So this is you now. When you're 10 years old, you'll be older and more developed, but will you still be Peyton? Would it make sense to say that you're the same person? Peyton says, yeah, I think so. I said, all right, let's go to 30. 30 years old. I said, let me tell you something about yourself, Peyton. At 30 years old, you have biologically and materially become something entirely different than you were at 10 and 6 years old. Every cell in your body has changed over so that it makes no sense to say that you are physically the same person that you were because the physical components that made you up have entirely changed over their material components. And another thing, Peyton, you are going to spatially be somewhere else. When you are 30 years old, you will not be geographically any longer in my home. You will be living somewhere else. That I promise you. And so at 30 years old, old, your whole makeup and your whole location have changed. But does it still make sense to say that you are Peyton, that you're the same person? He said, yeah, I think so. Even at 60, Peyton, you've entered into a new phase of life. Things have changed. Things are different. Your relationships to your children, you have grandchildren probably at that age. Uh, you are moving out of the workforce. Again, you are biologically something entirely different than you were 30. You're hopefully, obviously, someplace different as well at the age of 60. But does it make sense to say this is still the same person? <coughs> Peyton says, yeah. I said, okay, let's go back. Let's go to birth. The moment that you were born, and I brought you home from the hospital, was that a newborn Peyton? Was it the same person? He says, I think so. I pulled out a picture that we got when he, an ultrasound picture, and I said, this is a picture that was taken of you when you were 20 weeks old inside of your mother's body. Is that a picture of you, of Peyton at 20 weeks? Peyton said, yeah, I think so. He said, all right, finally, let's go back to the moment of conception. And he said, I have no idea what conception means. And I said, all right, we'll talk about that later. But right now, let's just say the moment that you came into existence, is that you? He said, yeah, I think so. He said, does that make sense then to say that Peyton began to exist there? He said, yeah, I think so. For the pro-life position, this is what's called... Identity through time and change. In order for us to make, now what did I tell you? At 10, 30, and 60, I'm materially something entirely different. So what maintains my identity can't be the physical makeup of Jay, because the physical makeup of Jay has radically changed over the 42 years of my life. And I'm geographically changing my place all the time. And I've emotionally changed, and I've developed and I've matured, and all of these things have changed about me, but if we say that it makes sense to say that on the continuum of this line, the person J exists, then that is called identity through time and change. And what maintains that identity in the, in the argument that I'm putting together here tonight as a pro-lifer? It's called the substance view of men. The substance view of person says that there's a substantial self that maintains that identity through time, my nature as a human being, and that is what gives me value. 
that I am the same person. It makes sense to say that when I broke my arm here and then I broke my other arm here and then broke it again two more times here and then when I was about here and had my head cracked open a Taekwondo fight, that all of this stuff happened to Jay. They were experiences of the person Jay and that are still me to whom they have happened to. Now the substance view of human being, we could say, well, I don't want to keep that identity through time because I don't like the idea of such a thing called natures and I don't like the idea of there being something that I don't understand, the substantial self that that holds my identity together and, and, and unifies this personal line into one person. But the problem is that so much of our life assumes the substantial view of human beings. Let's take our criminal justice system, for example. If I say that there is no nature, no substantial self to hold me there, I'm going to start to argue that there is different people throughout different times that exist because identity through time and change can't be maintained. Or I'm going to have to argue something else. And so that nature, if I say I commit a crime here at 18 and they put me in jail and I'm going to be there until the time in prison, the time I'm 35, then he would say the 35-year-old is an entirely different person unless there is something to unify that life. And we choose the substance as we talk about it, the nature of me as a human being, as the unifying nature of those. And J.P. Moreland and Scott Ray are the ones that said that almost so much of our community and the way that we interact with people assumes that there is identity through time and change, that we are talking to persons that have maintained that identity through all of it. So here's the question that I get. And can I use you for a second, sir? All right. So I'm trying to find some place of agreement between me and a pro-choice person. And so I ask you, not knowing where you stand on this position, and I'm not really worried about it right now, uh, I ask you this question, though. Would it be objectively wrong for me to kill you right now? Okay, yeah, he says yes. Okay, Uh, not everybody says yes, but most people do say yes. I ask that question a lot. Would it be objectively wrong to kill you right now? Well, he said yes, so what does that mean? What I learned from that is that he and I are not radically different people who see the world in this entirely different way. What I've learned from that is no matter what his opinion about abortion is, no matter where he stands on that issue, He believes that human beings are something of value and that it's objectively wrong to kill them. So if he disagrees with me in the case of the unborn, then I have to ask him this question. All right, if it is wrong to kill you now, and let's say you're 21, 20, how old are you? 20, okay. 20 years old. What changed from you at 20 years old to back here at 20 weeks old that if I killed you back then, it was a legally protected right. And if I kill you now, now, what do we call it? Okay. What was the substantial change? What made you from the kind of thing it was okay to kill to the kind of thing that it was not okay to kill? What happened to you? And here is the argument. Here is where we have the argument, the philosophical argument. They're going to have to come up with some reason to justify what it is that they're doing to the unborn. Now, we're going to watch a video here very quickly. It's a one-minute video. There is no sound. I'm going to warn you beforehand that the video does have graphic images. You are under no obligation to watch the video. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're going to be bothered by it, to not watch the video, to close your eyes and to look away. I will warn you before it starts uh, that it is about to start, and I will tell you when it's over. Why we're going to watch the video, I'd like to give a quote from a couple of different pro-choice philosophers really quickly, or one a feminist leader and one a pro-choice philosopher. One of them is from Naomi Wolf, a prominent feminist author and an abortion supporter, and she says this, clinging to a rhetoric about abortion in which there is no life and no death, we entangle our beliefs in a series of self-delusions, fibs, and evasions, and we risk becoming precisely what our critics charge us with being, callous, selfish, and casually destructive men and women who share a cheapened view of human life. We need to contextualize the fight to defend abortion rights within a moral framework that admits the death of a fetus is a real death. And Jeff McMahon, a philosopher, a pro-choice philosopher, says the standard methods of performing abortions clearly involve the killing the fetus. The fetus dies by being mangled or poisoned in the process of being removed from the uterus. Naomi Wolf warns against the idea that we cannot be afraid to look at the pictures because to be afraid to look at the pictures would make us exactly what they say we are. And in order to be able to be what we say we are, intellectually robust, pro-choice and abortion advocates, we have to have the courage to look at them. I'm going to offer them before we start the moral discussion of whether or not we have the right to do something to somebody because it's evidence as to what we are actually doing. It is an incontrovertible fact what's happening. The question is not, is it happening? The question is, are we justified in doing it? So I would encourage you to look away now.
All right, if you've looked away, the video is now over. What they have to do is argue what justifies the taking of innocent human life. We all recognize that it, that's what it is. And there's very little argument that from that entire timeline, what we are talking about is a human life. But what they're going to argue is that there's such a thing that is a human being who is not a person. And that persons have rights, not human beings. And when they make that argument, what they're saying is essentially that on that line that we're drawing to represent a human life, that there is some place on that line that we are merely human and that there are other places on that line that we are persons. And only during that time that we are persons on that line do we have rights. And they're going to have to use one of four criteria when they're using this. These four criteria that they're going to appeal to, we call the SLED acronym. Size, level of development, environment, and dependency. These are the things that they're going to point to and say, these are the things that make you personal, a human with rights, one of these things. And what we argue is that none of those are going to do the philosophical work necessary to justify what we just saw on that screen, to justify what is going on in the taking of a human. First, they're going to say size. It's very small. It's extremely small. They'll even say things like it's a clump of cells. It's just a clump of cells. There's two ways I want to address that. First of all, size does not give us value. If I had everybody in the room stand up right now, we would have people of varying sizes. You wouldn't look at the big people in the room and say, well, look how large they are. They have so much value. Very large people. You wouldn't look at the small people in the room and say, look how small they are. So sad. They can hold so little value. Uh, they're just tiny little people. We don't see size as the kind of thing that gives or takes away value. Size and all of these things are what we call degreed properties. They're things that come and go in degrees. We are large or we are smaller. I was at one point small, I am large. The smallest person in my house is my four-year-old daughter, Nika. She is not the least valuable person in our house by virtue of her size. And as we apply this standard around and look around, we do not ga gauge that size as a degree that which gives or takes away value. Value is intrinsic. Now, you can have extrinsic value by virtue of your size. So we've got to make sure that we're clear on those two different things. Extrinsic value you can have by virtue of your size. I am a lifelong Atlanta Falcons fan, which means for most of my life I have been a miserable wretch when it comes to supporting my football team. I am so happy to be in the Michigan area because anybody that grew up a Detroit fan knows what it feels like to follow a loser your whole life. <laughs> it is just a painful, awful experience of never-ending humiliation and lack of victories. The last few years have been much better but extrinsic value, talking about the Falcons, there's a guy by the name of Sam Baker. Sam Baker plays left tackle for the Atlanta Falcons. He is a large, strong man. And because of his large athletic ability and his strength, they put him on the left side of the line because he protects Matt Ryan from defensive ends. I am a small, old guy with relatively receding athletic ability, which means that the Falcons have no place, no extrinsic value on me at all because they know if they put somebody like me on that line, Matt Ryan would be dead before I hit the ground after the defensive lineman tossed me in the air and ran through me to get to him. I have so little value to the Falcons that they pay Sam Baker millions of dollars to play for them and they charge me just to watch them play. That's how little I matter to the Atlanta Falcons. But we're talking about intrinsic value. And intrinsic value is not established externally to ourselves. Extrinsic value is the value that other people put on us. Intrinsic value is the value we have by virtue of what we are. And it would be no greater moral offense to kill Sam Baker than it would be to kill me, even though he has a great deal of financial value to the Atlanta Falcons. So we have to differentiate the kind of value that we're talking about. When we discuss human value, we're talking about intrinsic value. When we talk about things like universal human rights, and we talk about equality of all people. In all of those conversations, we're assuming intrinsic value, intrinsic worth, worth that you have by virtue of what you are, not by the value that somebody externally places on you. And so when we're talking about size, size isn't a value-giving property. 
We don't intuitionally experience it that way with the people that we see, so why would we apply it to the unborn? Why would we say, because they're small, they have so little value? And as answer to the clump of cells, one of our favorite questions that we ask people is, what do you mean by that? And when they say the unborn are just a clump of cells, when I'm afraid we ask them the question, well, what do you mean by a clump of cells? Because by most definitions, I'm nothing more than a clump of cells. I'm just a larger, more mature clump of cells than the unborn are. They're not an uncoordinated out of control growth, they are still a whole distinct living human being with a self-coordinated, integrated growth and development that is gonna express their distinction in the same way that I am, they're just at a less mature stage than I am. They have exactly the number of cells that they need and exactly the size that they're supposed to have at the level of development that we find them at. So when you say that somebody's a mere clump of cells, you need to tell me what it is that we mean because they're not an undifferentiated mass. They are an organism working in a coordinated way. So size doesn't give us value. But what about level of development? Now here's where we're going to have some of the better arguments. Uh, now two, most, some of them, you know, the problem is what level of development is necessary for us to consider you a person? What the level of development do we decide gives you value such that prior to having that level of development or after that level of development or that ability leaves you, I can do whatever I want to you. You are no longer the possessor of rights. But once that attains, once it supervenes, what you call, upon the person, we now have a person that has rights. Now, they're going to say all sorts of different things. Some people say heartbeat. That happens like 20 weeks of gestation. That's a 20 there, 20 weeks. Some people will say the ability to feel pain. I mean, 20 days, not 20 weeks, I'm sorry. 20 days. Some people say the ability to feel pain. The ability to feel pain is widely debated on when that happens. It could be as early as like 15, 16 weeks. Some people place it at 20. Other people place it later. But let's just say 20 weeks for the sake of argument. 20 weeks in pain. Some people will argue, David Boonin will argue, organized cortical brain activity. Now, if you are interested in understanding the pro-choice position, you need to buy David Boonin's book. He is, in my estimation, the greatest pro-choice philosopher on the face of the planet today. And he is to be respected and by all accounts is a good man. He says cortical brain activity, which comes sometime between 20 and 30 weeks. Why does he say organized cortical brain activity? To, let's take a moment and talk about David Boonin because he is so important. Uh, why he says that is because that is the point at which you can have desires. You could be understood to have the actual capacity to desire something when organized cortical brain activity comes in. And he says desires, or the ability, the current capacity to be a, the kind of being that desires is what makes you valuable. Because once you can desire to continue living, taking your life away from you does you harm. So prior to that desire coming in, it's impossible to harm you. Now here's the problem though that he's gonna come up against in his level of development argument, his functional argument that he's offering. The ability to have desires is what makes you, is what makes you valuable. But he needs it to be an immediate capacity or what he calls a current desires. So first we've got a current desires. Those are the immediate desires that we have. I immediately desire right now for you not to kill me. Uh, I prayed that no one would kill me before I came in the room tonight. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, the idea of that I want to continue to living is a part of the desires that I have, and it gives me value. But what if I'm in a deep sleep? Or what if I'm in a temporary reversible coma? Or any one of those things. Or something happens where it diminishes my ability to have an immediate desire. So I'm not desiring actively anything. Certainly not desiring to be alive. So we can say, well, David, the, uh, Mr. Boonin, Dr. Boonin, the absence of those desires has suddenly been noticed. Does he, lack a bill, does he lack enough value because that desire is gone? Well, the answer to that is no. Because now David Boonin says, well, we attribute to him or her dispositional desires. Because we understand that even though they may be in a deep sleep or maybe in a reversible temporary coma, they still have dispositional desires. They're desires we attribute to them when they're not actively desiring things because we understand that humans want to continue living even when they're not immediately actively desiring to continue living. And so then we ask the question, but what about somebody like uh, Rick Warren's son who recently committed suicide, a young man who struggled his entire life with a desire to die. He wanted to die and they gave him uh, all sorts of things to try to fight, all psych psychological counseling and, and help and all the things that he needed to try to fight this because they saw this as a disordered, as ab abhorrent to, to a normal functioning brain. His desire was to die. Because he desired to die, would that mean that his life, the value of his life was less or forfeit? What about people who have become indoctrinated into believing that they ought to be slaves? 
And they ought to abhor freedom. And they're taught to be, what if they desire slavery? Does that mean that it's okay to enslave them because they're active desires? They're actively, willfully desiring that. What happens to cult members? Uh, the, the cult members, uh, can't, now their name is escaping me, but the ones that uh, the hale Bop Comet came and they all killed one another. They actively decided to die for their cult. Was that okay? Was it okay to kill them because their desire was to die? Was their death all right? Well, he says, well, no. So now we have what we call ideal desires. So if you're not actively desiring something, or if you are actively desiring the opposite of what you ought to be desiring, we're going to attribute to you ideal desires. Because ideal desires are the desires that you should have if you were a properly functioning human being. Now here's, what are we giving here? David Boone is starting to write out exceptions. <coughs> He's saying that it's not necessary for your desires to line up with what they ought to be. It's not even necessary that you currently have them because for all of these people, we're going to make exceptions. So the first question we ask David Boonin is why exceptions for them and not for those guys? Why, if you know that they're the type of being by nature that that desire is coming, that it's developing, and that it will be here shortly if you don't artificially terminate their life, why is it that they're allowed to have the ideal desire and the dispositional desire exception once it attains, but not prior to it attaining. What is it that when it's the same being, that it's got the same thing coming, and that desire is going to be there, that ability to desire is naturally going to occur as long as we don't kill it, why do they get the exception and not them? And here's another problem, and all of these fall into what's called the episodic problem, which means that all of these things come in degrees. They come and go in degrees. And value is not a degreed property. And if desire is the thing that gives you value, and desire ebbs and flows and comes and goes and changes and all of those things, there's no way around the fact that your desire or your value is doing the same. The episodic problem haunts all functional explanations of why we have value. And then finally, uh, when we're talking about David Boone and Christopher Kayser says the problem with David Boone's argument is not that desire can't be a component for why it's wrong to kill somebody. For his argument to stand, desire has to be the only reason that it's wrong to kill somebody. It cannot be one of many. In order for his argument to stand as the thing that gives value to human beings, it has to be the only reason. And we know that there's not one single reason that it's wrong to kill people. There can be multiple reasons it's wrong to kill somebody. It can be wrong to kill the President of the United States for multiple reasons, not the least of which is because he's a human being and you shouldn't kill other human beings without extreme justification. But also if the President of the United States is assassinated or killed, it can have ramifications for the whole world. And it will upset people on a massive level and scale in a way that it would not be for somebody else to die. So if I were to kill somebody who had no family and no friends, it's still wrong to kill that person in the same way that it's wrong to kill President Obama. But there will be all sorts of reasons that it's wrong to kill a President Obama that don't apply to that other person. And what Christopher Kayser says is for Boone's argument to hold, desires has to be the only reason it's wrong to kill somebody because it's the thing that gives you value as a human being. And it just can't do that. It can't overcome the episodic problem. It has the problem of all, writing sorts of all sorts of exceptions for people that he desires to continue to live, but the people he wants to have the freedom to be able to kill or destroy or the life that he wants the ability to terminate, he won't give those same exceptions to, even though they're the same kind of being they just don't have the immediate practice capacity for it. And so David Boone, and according to Christopher Cage, that's the weakness in his position. Now there's one other level of development that we hear, and it's argued by some of the greatest philosophers on the pro-choice side, and one of the two of those would be Michael Tooley and Peter Singer. And that is consciousness. They'll say, what gives you value on this line is when you are conscious. Now consciousness is not just merely being awake. What consciousness is, is being aware that you exist having an immediate awareness that you are a being. Now, here's the thing. Consciousness doesn't occur until somewhere about three to 18 months after birth, depending on how you define consciousness. So Peter Singer and Michael Tooley both advocate the position that there is nothing wrong with infanticide morally, that you can kill newborns without violating any moral law. They are not objects of our moral duties and obligations. And they're not alone. Lots of people argue this position. Last year, there was a paper that came out between an Australian and an Italian philosopher about afterbirth abortions. And what they talked about was, because consciousness gives value, and because that doesn't attain until long after you're born, then it is okay, since there are certain genetic abnormalities that are only gonna come up after they're born, and we're not gonna know about them until they manifest themselves and develop at that point, we should be allowed to take children home from the hospital, wait a while, and if any of these genetic abnormalities come up, that we don't want to live 
would have taken back to the hospital and had them killed, and we'll call those afterbirth abortions. That is the argument that is offered by those people that say consciousness. And arguments like Patrick Lee and Christopher Kayser and Frank Beckwith's response to that is, the problem that you have is that everybody defines consciousness differently. So you see, Michael Tooley says, one week after birth. You should have a week after they're born if you want to kill them. Peter Singer says, let's call it a month. Michael Tooley's reason is not because the newborns have value after a week, but he says that after a week of their life, if you haven't already killed them before they were born and you haven't killed them immediately after and you take them home from the hospital, we can all just assume that you want them to live. Peter Singer says three months or a month to three months after birth. And then after that, we should be able to, before that, there's nothing wrong with killing them after that. Now, they will all say we shouldn't go around killing newborns, but the reason they think we shouldn't kill newborns isn't because the newborns have value, but because it would upset you if we did that. And if you're a parent who wanted the child, that child has a value rooted in the fact that you desire for them to continue living, not because the child itself has any value. And then what Christopher Kayser and Frank Beckwith and Patrick Lee and all those guys say, well, here's the problem. Depending on how you define consciousness, some people would define con consciousness the kind of consciousness we're talking about when you can actually express yourself with language. That's like nine months to a year after you're born and for people with developmental problems much later than that. So if somebody bought into the idea that consciousness gives value and define consciousness as later in life, we're going to have people advocating for the ability to kill toddlers and things of that nature because that's such a moving target. The level of development does not give us value. It suffers from what we call the episodic problem. It is degreed by nature. We can't keep a constant total value in it. And ultimately what happens with the level of development is we look at it and we recognize we don't apply that to anyone else. My four-year-old daughter is less developed than anybody in the house. She, again, she's not the least valuable person in our house. Not by a long shot. And we saw this absolutely demonstrated very clearly in a case a couple of years ago in the, God, in the uh, Jewish settlements when Palestinian terrorists broke into a house and used a bayonet and they went to the house and they killed everybody in the house except for one of the daughters who was out visiting friends. And the last person that they killed in that house was a three-month-old little child. And nowhere in the world did anybody hear about that and say, well, it's a shame about everybody else, but that child was so young, so underdeveloped, and wasn't even conscious by all reasoning. There was no moral crime there. Actually, most functioning moral people heard about that, and that was the one that outraged us the most. It wasn't matter that he was undeveloped. What kind of a moral person could take a bayonet and stab it into a three-month-old child? There's something wrong. And so level of development doesn't give value. Environment is where you are. Geographically located in the woman, that does not take away your value. And being outside of the woman doesn't give you value. I know a woman who had a birth, uh, a labor that lasted 15 minutes. Of course, any woman that has given birth in this room knows that 15 minutes is incredibly fast. She was in her house, labor started, she didn't even get out the door before she had a baby. It's a 15 minute labor. Now here's the thing, that was a 15 minute period from the time that she was pregnant to the time that she had a child. And if right prior to that moment when labor started, she had decided that she wanted to have an abortion, she could have gone to any one of the six or seven abortion providers in this country that are willing to do late term abortions, and it would have been legal and a constitutional right for her to get an abortion all the way up to that point in a manner that's described in Gonzalez versus Carhartt, a Supreme Court case which tells you how to do late term abortions after they ban the practice of partial birth abortions. Abortions. The health exception in Doe versus Bolton overrides all talk of viability and overrides all talk of trimesters in Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood, and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And what it says is that women have to be able to get abortions when their health is at risk, and they, they categorize health risk as anything not just physical and not just to the direct health of the woman, but also familial or social or emotional. So any reason up to nine months, but 15 minutes later and eight inches down the birth canal at the other side of that, it would be murder to kill that child, infanticide, and it would be protected under the Born Alive Infant Protection Act. Peter Singer says this is hogwash. The same man that says that it's okay to kill newborns says that there's no reason at all to believe that you increase your value because you moved from here to here. If you're the kind of thing that it was okay to kill here, then you're the kind of thing that it's okay to kill here. And obviously he follows that to its logical conclusion and says, therefore, it is all right to kill newborns because the act of birth in and of itself can't possibly make you valuable. And then finally, dependency. They're so dependent on their mother so they can't be valuable in the same way that you and I are. I mentioned my daughter uh, a couple of months ago, my eight-year-old daughter was a radically independent little girl. 
Man, from the time that she was born, all she wanted to do was handle everything on her own. Sometimes she's difficult to teach because she won't listen to you because she wants to figure it out without you telling her what it is. But all of a sudden, that Sunday she's independent, that Monday she's in the hospital, she's got tubes tied up into her, she's got doctors giving her insulin injections, we're testing her glucose levels. Now, from here on out, she is radically dependent, not just on the insulin, but for right now, she's radically dependent on her mother and her family and the rest of us to do the work that her pancreas has ceased to do. And I get texts from my wife while I'm on the road in the middle of the night telling me what her blood glucose level is or calls where she says what should I do at this point my child went from being independent to radically dependent but did that make her less valuable this sudden onset of dependence make it less of a moral crime to kill her you know who else gets very dependent is our elderly as we get older and advance in our age, we become dependent on the community around us, sometimes our children, sometimes the people around us to take care of us and to help us. My own grandmother in her last years, and she lived to be 95 years old, but during her last year, she needed a lot of help, and she would stay over to our house, and I would go mow her lawn, and we'd do things to take care of her. There was never any point during those last few years that we ever sat down with a, as a family and said, you know, is getting very dependent and old. We ought to consider killing her because her value has decreased. In fact, if we would have said that, we would have been considered moral monsters. Who wants to kill them just because their dependence is growing? And so when we look at the unborn and say, well, they're so dependent on their mother, that doesn't make them valuable as a human being or not valuable as a human being. That's just the nature of where they are in their relationship to other people. Again, newborns are very dependent on their mothers as well, radically dependent on them. And I am not of the school that it's okay to kill newborns because I believe that they have value by virtue of what they are. So size, level, development, environment, and degree of dependency are not enough to say that they're not persons. And Christopher Kayser gives this warning in his book on the ethics of abortion where he says, we have throughout all human history categorized others as non-persons. This is not a new practice for us. It is something we have done over and over and over again. And in every single case, we have discovered later that we were morally mistaken and wrong. And we have come to know that what we were doing, whether it was enslaving them or killing them or driving them out of their homes, was wrong because they were valuable as human beings and we had no right to treat them that way. And he says, if we have finally found a group of human beings that we are actually justified in treating this way, it will be the first time in human history that we were ever right about this. It has never happened before. So we place them on the other side based on size, level of, develop, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency. These things don't do enough to categorize them as non-persons to which we can do whatever we want. Now there's one other argument I want to cover before we leave because there's one argument on the other side that says it doesn't matter that they're people. There's an argument by a woman named Judith Jarvis Thompson and it's the bodily autonomy argument. And this is one of the best arguments from the other side in that, it does what every great argument does. It grants the primary premise of the pro-life position. It says, I grant you that the unborn are human beings. I grant you that they're persons, and I grant you that, they're matter, that they matter. But it doesn't mean that abortion is wrong. And abortion can still be morally justifiable. And our argument is that a woman has the right to bodily autonomy, the right to control her body, and she is not forced by virtue of being pregnant to give her organs and her body over to the development of this other life. And she uses what's called the violinist argument to make her, her point. The violinist analogy goes like this. You wake up one morning and you find that you have been sewn to a world famous violinist. You found out that at the course of this, as you go to the hospital to try to find out what's going on, the doctor tells you, hey look, what happened was that this violinist developed a rare kidney ailment. And the Society of Music Lovers found out that you were a match as an organ donor. And so they went and found you. And in the middle of the night, they kidnapped you and attached you to this violinist. Now, here's the thing. He needs your kidney to survive. He needs your body to process and to go through all this. But he's going to be fine in nine months. So in nine months, we're going to pull you two apart. He says, I'm sorry that it happened. But if I disconnect him now, he will certainly die. So you're just going to have to stick with this guy for nine months. Now, Judith Jarvis Thompson argues, although it may be good, she calls it a good Samaritan, a great Samaritan act to help this guy out and to stay connected to him. I'm not morally obligated to offer my organs to this guy so that he can get over his ailment. 
I'm not morally obligated for my body to be used to help him to overcome what's bothering him and what has made him sick. I know he will die if I disconnect myself, and it would be an act of extreme generosity, what she calls a supererogatory act, the idea that there's obligations we have, and then there's supererogatory acts, acts that we do beyond our obligations, heroic acts. And she said it would be a heroic act for me to lend my body to him, but it's not necessary. It's not morally necessary for me to do so. Now, this is an argument of extreme power that we hear a lot on the campuses because it plays off, like all good arguments do, our moral intuitions. I would immediately hear that and say, you're right, I'm not obligated to say sewn up to that violinist. So the question, though, is, do the parallels hold? Is this parallel to birth and to abortion, because it's necessary for it to be parallel, for it to hold. And it simply is not a parallel. First of all, pregnancy is not like somebody sneaking into your house and sewing a stranger up on you in the middle of the night. Most pregnancies come through a willful act that we do. Now, Judith Jarvis Thompson sees that coming, and in order to get past that, she says, okay, some of you are going to say that pregnancy isn't like somebody sneaking into my house, so then she, or sneaking in or, and, and sewing somebody into me, so she says, what if I leave the window open and a burglar breaks into my house? I can remove that burglar from my house, but just leaving the window open, just like having sex, I didn't want to get pregnant, just leaving the open, window open didn't mean I want the burglar into my house. And so now to categorize the unborn as a burglar, an invader into the house. But even that starts to fail, because we say, well, you know, if you live in a high crime area, you're going to have to take some responsibility. And the burglar made a free choice to violate your, your life. The, the unborn did not. The unborn is there because you put them there. You did something, that an action that resulted in the mirror. So she says, okay, we'll forget the burglar. Now imagine that there's these spores of human beings that fly around in the air. And I put a screen over my house to keep the spores from coming in because if they get in the house, they get into the carpet and then they start to grow. And you would say, well, you're responsible for them if they get in your house. She said, oh, I put up the screen, but I can't keep them from from getting in and one gets in, I have no responsibility for that human spore just because it got into my house and into my carpet. See, the analogy, just in order to protect it, already starts to stray. She has taken the unborn from being a violinist that was sewn up to you overnight, that's a decent guy, to a burglar that has broken into your house that has to be killed, and ultimately to some strange alien human spore that we can't stop from populating the world. All of that to try to save the analogy. But it even fails in other places, because first of all, as we say, now it is a good analogy immediately. I, I was talking to Matt Flanagan, a philosopher from, uh, from New Zealand, and, and he's done a lot of work on abortion, and Matt said, you know, when I first heard Judith Jarvis Thompson's violinist argument, my first reaction was, it's a great argument if we're talking about rape, but it doesn't really work anywhere else. Now, I, I, I told him I didn't think it's a great argument about rape, but we can get to that later. Uh, now, here's another thing that David Boonin comes in and tries to rescue Judas Jarvis Thompson. And he said, okay, well, I may be responsible. We may be responsible for the existence of the child, but we're not responsible for the neediness of the child that comes as a result of its existence. In the same way that if a doctor gave somebody a pill that saved them, but then years later that person came to him and said, I have a rare blood disorder, and you're the only person that can save me, so if you would give me your blood and hook yourself up to me, we'll be able to get past this. And you're responsible for me because you're responsible for my existence because you saved me back then. He says the doctor is not responsible for the neediness that this person finds just because he's responsible for his existence. But of course, Peter Sa or, uh, uh, Christopher Kayser responds that being responsible for the continued existence is not the same as being responsible for the actual existence. A doctor just prolonged a life that was already there. When we're talking about conception, we're talking about people responsible for the life existing at all. And so the whole, the, the, that compatibility doesn't hold. Here's another problem. What does she say about how they're going to disconnect themselves? She said, well, I'm going to unplug myself from the violinist, and it's not my fault if he dies. And in that analogy, that's true. What's going to kill the violinist? His kidney disease, right? Oh, is abortion the unplugging of an innocent human life from another? The practices of, divorce, of abortion are not merely unplugging the life. Did, did those pictures look like an unplugged life? Something that was unplugged and allowed to die by its pathology? No, the practices of abortion are suctioning out of the woman's body, of cutting it up into little pieces, of using saline and, and poisoning it, of pulling out his body piece by piece 
a direct assault on the unborn life. It's not unplugging. He said, well, how would that analogy fit if we said instead of unplugging her, that the, the, the person that was attached to the violinist stabbed the violinist to death, chopped them up with an axe into little pieces, suctioned them through some suction to tear them to pieces. It would suddenly not be any longer that person dying because they had a pathology. They would be dying because you were killing them. And it would be an entirely different moral action. And then finally, Judith Jarvis Thompson, according to Frank Beckwith, draws in a philosophical position that she has not yet defended. You see, what she says is, I grant you that they are persons, that they are human beings, that they have value. But then she says that parents have absolutely no obligations to their children that they don't agree to voluntarily. I have no, apparent, I have no obligations to my children simply because they are biologically mine. Well, I don't agree to that. When I say we're a human being, I don't agree to what he calls moral volunteerism. The idea that I only have the obligations to which I volunteer for, and that I don't have any natural duties by virtue of my relationship to somebody. Because we understand, in Georgia when I was younger, there was what they called a deadbeat dad channel. Uh, and, and what they did was, that in, a, in an attempt to shame fathers who tried not to pay for the children that they had, they ran pictures of them on TV with a marker over them, deadbeat dad, you know, and they would tell you who they were and how, what they were like. And I actually loved that. I thought that was awesome. Because a father has obligations to his children. And if he's trying to duck them, he should be shamed. As a culture, we recognize that. And we force fathers who are trying to duck paying for their children. It doesn't matter whether you wanted them. It doesn't matter whether you probably, you have the action to bring them into this world. You're responsible for them. We recognize we have natural obligations to our children. But not in Judith Jarvis Thompson's analogy. We don't. When we ask the question, would it make any difference to the analogy if it wasn't a violinist, but her child, her own child, would we say, oh, well, she's perfectly within her rights if she just unplugs the child and they die because she has no responsibility whatsoever to that child to keep them alive. Well, the analogy would feel altogether differently then, wouldn't it? Suddenly the intuitions that told us unplugging the violins, violinist seems reasonable are gone because it's a woman allowing her child to die when she could save them. And then finally, and, and I, I don't mean it sounds superficially, but, but pregnancy is in no way uh, akin to laying in a bed tied to a violinist for nine months for most people. There are rare cases where women are, are bed bound for their entire pregnancy, but in a lot of times, my wife, I mean, she could do almost anything all the way up to the point that late in her pregnancy, there was no constrictions or restraints in her life. She could visit people. She could go do whatever she wanted. I remember one time I would joined a gym and you know, when you join gyms, they force you to have a personal trainer for like a day. And so I had this woman that was my personal trainer. It was like 50 minutes into my session with her before I realized she was pregnant. It's like, you're pregnant. She's like, yeah, I'm like eight months pregnant. I was like, how is that possible? I mean, you've been doing all this stuff. Women are capable of having healthy pre pregnancies that allow them to be productive and to live their lives. Every pregnancy is not the same as tying a violinist to a woman and forcing her to lie in a hospital bed for nine months. The analogy fails over and over again, and we could go on for hours, I assure you, on the way that it falls. But the problem is the autonomy argument fails because the parallels that it relies on don't parallel to abortion, and to natural childbirth, and to natural pregnancy. So, that in a nutshell <laughs> is the academic case for life. Like I said, it's an incomplete case, but I have given you the opening of what it was that we go around and talk about and read and study. The idea is that you understand not just the complexity of our case and to understand what it is that we're arguing. That we simplify the issue by focusing on what are the unborn. We argue science that they're human from the moment they come into existence. And we argue philosophy that human beings matter. Human life matters. And that it's wrong to kill human beings without extreme justification. And that the size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency, the SLED acronym, they don't do enough philosophical work to cast a whole other group of, of human life as non-persons that we have the right to do whatever we want to to them. And the strongest argument, the bodily autonomy argument, fails to convince because it doesn't have the parallels necessary to directly apply to pregnancy, to abortion, and to the relationship that mothers naturally have to their children, unless you want to radically redefine what it is when we say that they are human beings. Are there any questions? I know I've kept you longer than we were supposed to. I know we started a little late, but the... I have a question. Yes, ma'am. What is your position on this, um, birth control? I am not in principle against uh, contraception. Uh, I, you know, any, any contraception that would uh, lead to the death of an innocent human life, I would obviously have a problem with. But just contraception in general, I have no in principle problem with it and generally don't talk much about it. Uh, is that helpful? Yes. Okay. Right, you guys are letting me off easy. There's one question y'all aren't asking, so I'm just going to let y'all do it. If, unless, if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, by the way, you're welcome to do that as well.
But I mentioned something like three times and nobody's asked me about it, so I'm just going to let it go. I, I just want to ask. Uh, yes. I didn't make that switch quite quickly. It took me a long time to make that switch. When you were, I guess, I mean, how, did you, how do you make that switch? Let me tell you what I know about the abortion issue. The overwhelming number of people have never even thought about it. Uh, I'll give you a statistic that demonstrates for you. About 67% of the people in the United States, 60 to 67% of the United States, since Roe v. Wade was enacted, have routinely polled that they think that there ought to be meaningful restrictions to abortion. Now, that doesn't mean that they think that it ought to be outlawed altogether, but most people think that it ought to be restricted and meaningfully restricted, that the practice of abortion should not be an open policy at any time, at all times. The same number of people, 60 to 67 percent of people, said that they absolutely support Roe v. Wade as a law. Now, the, Roe v. Wade as a law in the companion piece with Doe versus Bolton says that abortion is unregulated, unrestrained through all nine months of, of pregnancy, and it's a constitutional right for women to get an abortion through all nine months as long as the health exception from Doe versus Bolton is added in. So at one point, you have the majority of people in the United States saying, we ought to have restriction, and then the rest of the time, you have people saying, well, I think Roe v. Wade's a great thing. Well, why do they think Roe v. Wade's a great thing? Because the overwhelming majority of people when they polled don't have the slightest idea what the current abortion laws are in the United States. So they haven't even thought about it. The majority of people are trying to avoid the issue. They want to duck it as much as they can. It's uncomfortable and they don't like to talk about it at all. And so sometimes it's very easy to move people over because they haven't thought. And it's not really, I mean, I, I have atheist friends that are a part of the pro-life movement. I have Jewish friends that are part of the pro-life movement. I have Muslim and gay friends. I mean, it's so, you know, when you're talking about it's wrong to kill human beings, that's not a Christian position. <laughs> and so as long as somebody's willing to acknowledge that there's such a thing as objective moral values and that we have duties to other people, they are open to join the camp of people who say that these are persons we ought not to kill. And so it's not terribly difficult to convince most people. Now, when you're talking about somebody that's radicalized, the crusader, uh, that's a little different, obviously, because they're not listening, and they're not there to listen to what you're saying. And so, but sometimes it takes a, a little, you, you make headway when you don't think you are. You can get a lot of work done when you think you're not. And I have had several times where I've talked to people that come up to me afterwards and said, I was so upset when you came and I don't want to hear a word that you said and I'm pro-choice. But after hearing your presentation today, I got to go home and think about a lot of what we talked about. That's not normal though. You know what victory is for me? This is, how I think, victory in a good conversation. When I get finished talking to somebody who disagrees with me and they say this, I never thought about it that way. I need to go away and think about it some more. When they say that, that's victory. Because people change their minds slowly. Nobody changed their mind quickly. No, but not about important things. It takes a while to move them from one position to another. So by quietly, slowly, respectfully allow them to move that position, all I want to do is make my case. And, and, op, and, and, and it requires us, by the way, to talk to people in a manner that controls our emotions and to not let the emotion of the situation get a hold of us. I have to go into places where people sometimes yell at me or say ugly stuff to me when I first show up. That's fine. Greg Kokel said, you know, uh, if anybody gets mad, I lose. So my job is to bring the rhetoric down to a place of respect and reasonable discourse. And if I can be heard, I can move them. And yes, I have seen people switch a lot, uh, but not usually immediately. It's usually I get contacted later and say, I've been thinking a lot about it, and it's just hard to hold on to. Uh -oh. Any other questions? Yes, sir. It's not, it's not a necessary condition for people to switch. Uh, no, I realize it is, yeah. but I, I would have to think that uh, it would be the main factor of people switching. You know, what, now, generally speaking, and, and I'll say this, what I said, as a Christian and an unapologetic Christian, 
Um, I believe wholeheartedly in the image of God, the Imago Dei, and those are things that factor into my thinking as to how I process those things. But when I'm talking to somebody about this issue, all that's necessary is for them to recognize that objective moral values are real and that they believe that we can know them. Now, I can, as a, as a Christian and a Christian apologetics guy, recognize that the, the atheist standing next to me who agrees that objective moral values exist, uh, let's say Sam Harris, uh, Walter Sennett Armstrong, Michael Martin, these are all atheists that argue that objective moral values exist. I can say as a Christian, ultimately they're not going to be able to ground those beliefs, in my opinion, without appealing ultimately to a moral law giver. But that's an entirely different argument because when we're talking about the existence of objective moral values and where we ground them, that's a question of ontology, of their being, of, of their source and their roots. All that's necessary for me to agree with somebody on the abortion issue is an epistemological knowledge of objective moral values. So I don't have to get into, when I, when I talk to atheists about the, the pro-life position, we'll talk about the Christian stuff when I'm done with the presentation and we'll have those conversations. At the time that we're talking about the, the pro-life stuff, as long as they agree that it's objectively wrong to kill another human being, I welcome them to the pro-life side and wholeheartedly encourage them to keep fighting their fight. And I know some atheists out there that are doing fantastic work is standing up for the, the unborn life. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I agree with everything that you said. The, we, but we make a mistake sometimes when we're talking about moral knowledge of not being able to separate those two things. The idea of epistemology, of knowing moral values, believing they exist and that we can know them and our ability to ground them. And we can agree, atheist, Muslim, Jew, Christian, Mormon, everybody out there, we can agree that objective moral values exist and that we can know them and apply them in our lives. And then have a disagreement about how we'll ultimately ground those and where they come from. And for the pro-life position, all that's necessary to convince somebody that abortion is wrong is to, is to convince them that the unborn fall within the class of human beings that it's objectively wrong to kill. And, and, and ultimately, it may raise those questions of grounding later, uh, but they're not necessary here. And, and keeping those things separate will actually keep us from having some rather unproductive conversations with people who disagree with us about things, when, when on this particular point, we ought to be agreeing for the sake of those we're trying to protect. Yeah, I understand what you're yeah. saying. I'm just saying that even latent in a person's yes. mind, they would not even be able to, to qualify that as a reason for themselves. But somewhere, I think that in a lot of switching of that sort, there's something happening beyond I hear you. just the issue. I absolutely hear you. And I probably, you and I, Christian to Christian, out there talking outside of this room, I would probably end up agreeing with you to some level or another. Uh, but in that kind of presentation style. Okay, anything else? Yes, uh, first you and then you. Yes, sir. Aha! Uh -huh. I said three times that you guys are letting me off the hook and not making me talk about something tonight, so thank you for bringing it up. Uh, now, and I'm seriously, thank you for bringing it up. I, didn't want to, I want to respect everybody's time, and I knew we're getting late, so I didn't want to keep talking when people might want to leave. Uh, but cover the, let's cover the rape issue. Let's take it from two different positions. One is that more often than not, when people talk about rape, they presuppose the inhumanity of the unborn. That's the first mistake they make. There's two different ways that we're going to have to look at rape, though, if we're going to talk about it. And then there's a third thing that I want to preface it by talking about. Uh, the preface comes with when I have to, what did Richard Mordock and Todd Aiken do wrong when they answered those questions as Senate candidates that cost them their elections? Because both of them did something wrong. Both of them didn't realize that when you're answering the rape question, you have to answer it as if you're talking directly to a rape victim, even if you're not. And you have to be sensitive to the idea that even answering moral issues, I'm talking to emotional and spiritual beings. And if a woman was raped, and I say something like it, that life is God, God planned for that life to exist and so we can't destroy it, a woman is going to hear me saying that God planned for her to be raped. And that's not a good thing. If I do what Todd Aiken said and I say that, that uh, when a woman is legitimately raped, there's a mechanism that comes on in her body that prevents implantation, what the woman, the rape victim, is going to hear me saying was that you weren't legitimately raped because you got pregnant through that rape. Uh, you wanted it effectively. And that's a horrifyingly insensitive thing. I mean, I, I am dumbfounded that that could come out of a reasonable person's mouth and not realize how badly he hurt people all over the country when, he, when they heard that. So, but 
I have to be consistent in my position. And that's exactly why they call it a hard case, because I don't want to have to say that we shouldn't be allowed to kill the, concept of the, the, the products of rape, because I know at the other end of rape, there's a woman who is victimized. Now, I will say this, that over half the women who are rape victims who conceive in rape actually carry their children to term. Most of those end up placing them in adoption. But a pro-choice person isn't going to argue against that, because they, they, should be able, they should be able to choose it. What shouldn't happen is that you shouldn't be able to force them to have their child. And why do I have the right to say that somebody else is immoral in terminating the law conceived in rape, if that's what they need to do to get over that rape? So for the first question, we look back at the toddler, because I've got to demonstrate that they're presupposing the inhumane and the unborn, but first also I've got to recognize that rape is a grave moral evil. And when I talk to them, I say, look, rape is a moral evil, and the rapist ought to be punished to the fullest extent of the law, and that we as a culture have got to do something more about sexual assault and the way that we treat women who have done it. Not just as a culture, but me as a Christian, I acknowledge that my church and the people that I work with, we have got to make pointed efforts to reach out to those people who are victims of this, to give them what they need spiritually, emotionally, physically, materially to get through this. But I have a two-year-old child here next to me, and this two-year-old little girl, at least once a day, her mother is going to look at her and be reminded of the worst moment of her life the worst thing that ever happened to her, and at least once a day, she's gonna go through this profound pain and depression, remembering that when she looks at this child. So would it be okay for me to kill that child to relieve that mother of that pain? Well, I've had pro-choicers screaming at me and, pro and abortion advocates screaming at me at one second, telling me how unfair I was, and when I asked them that question, their response was, well, no, of course not. Why not? It will help the mother. She won't have to see and remember this anymore. And this will it's a human being. Okay, then. If the unborn are human in the same way that she is, then we're not going to kill them because they remind us of something terrible either. I'm not saying it's not hard. And I'm not saying I even like it. But you know what? You know why this question is hard? Because abortion is hard. Because a rape is hard. Because rape is a terrible thing. And there's no good way out any longer. The evil that somebody else has done on this woman has taken fair and easy off the table. And there's nothing fair for her any longer. But I cannot stand before you and say that I think it's morally permissible to kill one life to pay for the crimes of another. Now, Judith Jarvis Thompson has said that she concedes that the unborn are persons. And so, and I'm going to address her, I have to address her differently, because it's not somebody that's presupposed that the unborn are not human, she just thinks that the unborn aren't persons, or are persons, but that the bodily autonomy rights of the woman supersede that. And so when we're talking to her or somebody like that, we say, okay, there are three people, by your own admission, involved now in this rape. Three people. Do you believe that the rapist ought to be killed for the crime that he committed? Is rape a capital crime? Now, I am actually surprised how often I ask that question and how many people think it ought to be. And I can understand that. As the father of two daughters, as a husband and as a son, as a brother, that I would understand the idea that if somebody raped any one of those women that I love, that I would want them dead. But I don't believe that rape ought to be a capital crime right here in the United States. And most people still don't believe that. Well, you have the woman. Should she be killed as a result of the rape? Now, you might find that question shocking, but there are cultures that do that that they see her rape as a dishonor to their family, and they will kill her for bringing dishonor to their family. So should she be killed? That's a monstrous question to even have to ask. Everybody says no. So now we've got the third person, the acknowledged, admitted third person. Should they be killed for the crime of the rapist? Do you think everybody that hears that immediately changes their mind? Of course not. But all of those people that were immediately angry at me a moment ago, were yelling or screaming at me, have now heard me. And I say, look, I know I got hard cases. We all do. And Leon Cass says, there is no ethical system that we can put in place that will not have its hard cases. And the other side has theirs too. You want to ask them about sex selection abortions. Why is it okay to kill? The, you know, the number one reason that babies are aborted throughout the world is because they're females. And for those who support the right to abortion, they have a hard time explaining why that's wrong, but every other reason to get an abortion is okay. And so everybody has their hard cases. That's mine, and I own it, and I understand that it's hard. But I, I've, I have noticed that when I give that reasonable answer, recognizing the evil of abortion, at the end of the day, the person may not agree with me immediately, but they do say, I never thought of it that way before, and they more often than not understand my position. Yeah, that's right. And we've got to figure out the best that we can do with a bad situation that we've found ourselves in. And sometimes we're not looking for a good, we're looking for minimizing evil. Now, yes, sir, I'm sorry. It's interesting that it's um, abortion was for female rights, but it kills mostly women. Yeah, it, it, and it is a, there's a list of hard cases that we actually do 
when get the opportunity to ask them. But it is, it is, there is a, a, an absurdity that has been brought up, not just by my boss, but by several others before me, that says that, that there's a point in the development of a, of a woman that her reproductive so, uh, organs start to show up earlier in her development as a female. So inside her mother's womb, as her reproductive organs show up, she has, by the nature of the discussion of rights here in the United States, the right to abort any of her future children that are going to be a product of that reproductive system, but not the right to live herself. Uh, that's a strange absurdity that the laws that we currently have ha uh, are, are um, forcing on us. I personally, obviously, disagree with it. <laughs> but, all right. Any other questions? I, I just, oh, yes, sir. I'm so sorry. I really appreciate you bringing that the race question that we actually had as part of that discussion at dinner tonight. Um, but this is a personal question. Yes, sir. Uh, if I remember right, that um, at one point in your life you were atheist and you mm -hmm. were pro-choice, and, and you said that typically people don't make their minds up, you know, over a short period of time. Was there some type of an aha, epiphany-type moment in your life where you decided not to be pro-choice and an atheist? They were not the same time. Uh, I became a Christian first, and then I would, I would say I went from being uh, pro-choice to I don't want to talk about it to uh, agnostic on the issue. And then ultimately, the kind of arguments we're discussing today started to change my mind dramatically. Uh, there was a moment where I became, I would say, mobilized. Uh, so I was convinced of the humanity unborn far before I was convinced that I ought to do anything about it. Uh, the day that I was convinced that I ought to do something about it was that moment of uh, if what I'm saying about the unborn are true, if they are, you know, what I believe about the unborn, if they are human, and if I look at what's going on in the world, I have to recognize that I live in a time of tremendous wrong, a great moral evil in the, in the world that I live in, and I'm not doing anything to stop it. I'm just sitting around, not liking it, maybe, if you bring it up, personally against it, but not doing anything to stand up against it. And that was the moment that I realized that something had to change, either my, my conclusions about the identity of the unborn and their worth, or what I was doing in response to what was going on in the world around me. I am too convinced of the case of the strength of the philosophical and scientific case of the unborn is fully human and of their value as human beings, of the inclusive view that being a human gives you rights and the right to life comes by nature of our humanity and that there is such a thing as universal human rights that transcend the governments and that they're pre-legal and that we get by virtue of what we are by our nature. And because I'm convinced of that, uh, I woke up and realized, well, I gotta do something. And now... Very huh? You're very passionate. Yes, yes. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. God bless you guys. I appreciate your time.